Well, good morning, everyone. This is the second uh, webinar in a leadership series that we are doing. Um, the, you know, the first one we really talked about leading yourselves. And today we're going to talk a little more about leading your teams. And it occurs to me that we have a lot of solo operators. And so when you talk about leading your teams, I wish, you know, going back uh, when I, I first started to hire someone and I really didn't know how to be an employer, uh, I wish that I had these lessons under my belt and that I, I really had a lot more mentorship around it. I also wish that I would have thought about my processor that maybe I was using at the company, but was, was processing most, most of my loans, my underwriters, my underwriting manager, all as part of my team and, and really, you know, infuse these lessons. So if you are a solo operator and you're thinking that today is really just all about teams, please don't check out. Um, there are a lot of ways that you can apply these lessons and we'll try to make sure that, you know, we are, are um, imparting those lessons on to you as, as much as we can and making it as applicable to you as it is to anyone else, because it certainly is. Um, and I, I know that probably all of us has seen the, um, you know, the mass layoff that happened at better.com. And, and, you know, today we may allude to that uh, as a leadership lesson. And, and certainly our goal is not to bash a competitor. I think, uh, you know, a lot of people can make mistakes and, and, I certainly do not want to be the person that judges that, but because it is something that has been so visual and it has been in our industry, um, you know, we may allude to that as, as a way, you know, to, um, to provide context and contrast rather to, to these leadership lessons, just because I believe that it's something that a lot of you may have seen um, and, and may have witnessed. And there's so much, you know, chatter going on around that, um, and so, um, you know, I, I just want to put it out there that this, um, you know, we certainly don't want to want to bash a competitor in, in any way. That's not the goal here, but hopefully it helps in illustrating and taking away actual tactics that you can uh, you can use tomorrow or today uh, in your business, which is always our goal is that we want you to walk away uh, with a bunch of value. And as always, I know a lot of you are on the road, a lot of you are taking calls, a lot of you are multitasking, but to the extent that you can be here and be on video, uh, it really helps us to read the room, uh, know what's going on, and, and, and be able to have a more engaged uh, session with everyone. And so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Chris Ledley, uh, one of the best leaders in the industry, in my opinion, uh, and, and Chris would love to just download with you and, and get you know, kind of your biggest takeaway uh, from the conference that we went through uh, and just impart some wisdom on us here today, man. Cheers. Hi, buddy. You got it. I appreciate the uh, the compliment there. It means a lot coming from you. Um, so, you know, I, I want to make sure that everybody really understands the way that we presented this, right? So what did we start with? In our last webinar, we went through how to lead yourself, right? And really what that is, how do you show up for yourself? How do you take care of yourself? And, and I think that we need to make sure that that is an absolute priority because if you're not taking care of yourself, your ability to show up for others, your ability to lead others is going to be impacted. You're not gonna show up in the way you want. So I wanna make sure that we don't glaze over those lessons that were learned in that last one, but, uh, but understand that that's foundation work that allows us then to show up as better leaders for those around us. And, and, and Mark did a great job of breaking this down that leadership is not a title, right? Leadership is the way we show up, the way we inspire others. So whether you have a team of five, whether you're running a branch of 50 or whether you're a solo practitioner, as Mark said, these lessons here are invaluable to inspire and influence the people around you in your life that you rely on, that your business relies on. So I would, I would take this back a little further and look back on my career over the leadership that I have given and the leadership that I have experienced and the management that I have given and management that I've experienced, right? And so, you know, I look back on, on people that were influential in my life and people that, that really helped mold who I am today as a leader. And I always learned the greatest lessons from what I don't want to do from people. And so, you know, that's the management side of it. The management side of it sometimes can be perceived as these are the orders I'm giving you. I'm telling you to do this. I'm holding you accountable to do this. And, and don't mistake me, accountability can be an absolute great tool to motivate and inspire people. But when it goes to the point of micromanagement, 
we lose the empowerment side of it. And that's what continuously pulls us back in the business. That's where you see the team fall apart, the team lose inspiration. And then we're scratching our head and saying, I just don't understand why they don't get it. I don't understand why they don't show up the way I show up every day. And it's because they're not inspired. It's because they don't understand. It's because we aren't showing up the way we need to as leaders. So I want to I wanna really hit on the empowerment side of this and how do you go about empowering your team? And you know, it, 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 there's a quote by Ben Franklin that says, tell me and I will forget. Teach me and I will remember. Involve me and I will learn. So the learn aspect of it is what we're trying to create out of this. That's where the team understands the why, and there's a connection to what they're doing and the way they're showing up. So it's not just as, as easy as saying, hey, I told them to do this. I've, I've shared my vision with the team. Everybody knows why we show up at work every day. There are fundamental steps that need to occur in order for that foundation work to be built. And so that's what I want to get in today. You know, Mark alluded to the fact that we were all out at Jocko Willenick and, uh, and Leif Babin's event, uh, the Echelon Front. And it was really powerful. And, you know, I pulled, I pulled over my career from so many different, you know, leadership training and, and, and you know, workshops that I've done. And what I, what I always like to do is I'm like, what is going to resonate with me, right? What's a parallel that resonates with me? And, and really the way that Jocko and Leif broke down empowering a team and the process they do, it clicked for me. I'm like, that's an easy way to articulate it. And so essentially what they did is they broke it down into four laws of combat is what they call them. And what's super important to recognize here is you cannot skip to step four without going through the foundation work that's required in one, two, and three. And I personally will share with you, over my career, I have absolutely made that mistake plenty of times. And four, I'm going to go ahead and just, just spoil it here for you. Four is the idea of the team truly being empowered, them owning their role. And that's one of those things that we look at a lot of times and say, Man, it would be so great if I could just step out of this area of my business, right? And trust the team to do this. Why don't they understand? Why aren't they getting it? You know, I'm giving them the ability. I'm telling them that it's their role. I'm telling them that they're empowered. It's because the foundation work, which we're going to cover today, has not been properly outlined for them. So let's let's jump into it. So law one. So law one is cover and move. So cover and move, if you think about it from a military standpoint, that is essentially we have each other's back. I understand what everybody on my team is doing, and we all look out for one another. Let's break it down in the business world, right? That is teamwork. We are one team. We are one unit. We win together and we fail together. And I mean, I'll, I'll ask you guys right now, how much in your business today do you celebrate as a team when things go well? Right. Like, is that part of your core DNA that when things go well, this is the entire team that played a role in it? What about on the other side of it? When things don't go well, when things fail, is it, hey, we're pointing the finger at the processor that forgot to order the VOE and that's why closing docs didn't get out on time. And now my reputation's ruined. That's not that's that's not failing together. That's me pointing the finger at somebody else. And what that does is that takes away from the foundation of creating a safe environment that takes away of the creation of we are one team that we get to win together, but when we fail or we have challenges, we are one unit here. That foundation work has to be laid for it to be a safe environment to even be able to progress through to get to that point that we all wanna to achieve to where our team is truly empowered. Next on number two, keep it simple, okay? Too often, we believe that we are clearly and concisely communicating to the team. Okay, we'll put out there, here's what the plan is. Here's what our process is. Here's the way we show up from a customer service standpoint. And all of a sudden, I'm looking at the team going, what, what was the miss here? Like, I, I'm just blown away. Like, where did this get lost in communication? I was not clear in my communication. Or here's another big part. As you go down to simplifying this message that you're delivering, whatever it is that we're trying to get through or trying to communicate in our goals and our processes, absolutely need to be clear, concise, and simple. And then the team needs to understand why. That why is so incredibly powerful. The why allows us in moments of, of chaos and moments of, of things coming at us from every direction to say, oh, wait a minute, here's why we do it this way. And it attaches back when, when we're a little derailed, when we're a little flustered, it attaches back to it is important that we execute in this way because of this why behind it. 
Now, the other move that I think is really, really important that, you know, was, was kind of described in any time that we go through explaining a process or setting an expectation, how often are we checking for understanding, right? How often are we having the team give it back to us in their words? Hey, let's go over that again. Walk me through what you understand as our process is going to be when we have a loan approval come in. That is the easiest way that you can catch this up front beforehand if there's a miscommunication, if there's a misalignment of agreements or a misalignment of expectations. It is not fair if I did not clearly communicate for me to beat or hold my team accountable to something that they didn't understand because of my failure to clearly communicate. So I think it's really, really important is anytime that we're having conversations that require, hey, this is our plan, this is our mission, these are our goals, get engagement with the team. Get the team involved in the communication. Hey, let's walk through this together. What is your role in this process here? That's going to check for understanding. That's going to allow us to drive the why home at an even higher level to reinforce the fact of, all right, here's what our process is. Are we all on the same page? Do we actually truly have equal or the same agreements and expectations in this? Okay. Any questions on one or two? I'll, I'll pause here for just a second, see if there's any questions or comments anybody wants to add. I, I just will add a, a comment. Um, Craig Strent, who <clears throat> who it's, is in a coaching group with us, I believe he's actually on this call, but we were in um, I, we were in uh, Costa Rica, and he he said something that I wouldn't forget, which is like when you're explaining something, if anyone ever says all you have to do is, and so like I. I, I try to catch myself now anytime I have that thought of like, all you have to do is like, that's a clear way of like, they don't have it like figured out. It's not simple enough. It's not concise enough. And a lot of the things that we do and convey, especially when you get rolling at a hundred miles per hour, things that you might say over and over and over, and you know, to be second nature, other people might not necessarily have it be second nature. And so it really does take a lot of self-discipline to slow down, understand that person hasn't connected the dots, really enroll them in the why, like you said, make it more simple and more clear uh, and move forward. And instead, you know, it just seems like so many of us in this industry, a lot of people that I coach myself personally, it's like, hey, all you have to do is, you know, and, and show them once, but then you're not getting that involvement and, and the, the enrollment in the why. And I think that that is, um, you know, it, it's one thing to say it, Chris. It's another thing to be able to be aware of it all the time, to spot it in your practice, to slow down with a super grumpy underwriter who doesn't want to take the time to get the involvement and say, wait a second, like, what is your role in this process? What is it that's scaring you about this? I want to make sure if I go get this condition, it's exactly what you need, because you know what? You matter. I don't. I don't want a black mark by your name any more than you want a black mark by your name. You know, and, and getting that, you know, that that full buy-in. I'm not sure if that was the great um, greatest example, but I think there there's so much that can be done with a simple, clear, and, and enrolling people in the involvement. But dude, I struggle with how long that takes to do, and the patience, and so many things that I'm running through every single day to stop and slow down and do that. Man, I got to be honest. Our great, great um, commentary or addition on that, right? And that it drives back to the Benjamin Franklin quote, right? What happens? How do, how do they learn? Involve me, right? And that's the easiest way to get the team involved. If we have an actual conversation, nobody wants to just be told, right? Like you, you, if you just sit there and say, hey, you're going to do this, 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 this. It's kind of like it brings us back to when we were a little kid when the parent, when our parents just say, you can't do this or you have to do this, you have to do this, right? Like I want to be involved in this, right? I want to be part of this. I want to believe that I had agency and influence. And if we're having a two-way conversation like that, that's where it really drills it in. That's where I get behind the why. And I feel that I am part of what we've built here. So great hey, addition. Chris, I appreciate that, Mark. Can I just underline one thing that you, that you said? At, you, you, you said something to the effect of we need to perception check with the person that we're giving the instructions to, to make sure that they heard us because we as leaders might think that it's simple, but you know, I, I remember I was reading a, a, Har a Harvard business review and they were talking about communication and the amount of communication that was misduplicated or not understood. And it was some shockingly high number that only like 48%, the other person when, when they were given instructions actually retained. 
And so I think that final step is, you know, keep it simple, tie it to the why, and then perception check. So could, will you please repeat back to me what you heard me just say? Great. That gives me a minute to catch my thoughts and to clear if there was anything else I forgot to communicate. And it also gives them a chance to repeat it. And I can go, yes, you nailed it. Thank you. Okay, cool. Let's go. So that's just the last piece that I think is really, really important on that. Love that wording, Josh. That, that's, a, that's a great way to put it back out to the team. And, and again, you accomplish so many things out of, of just taking that little bit of extra time to make sure, hey, we're all in alignment here, right? We're on the same page with this. Cool. Anything else before I move on? Very good. So let's jump in. Uh, number three, law three is prioritize and execute. So for me, my day, honestly, I plan it out the night before I put it on my calendar and literally I just never have any derailment. Nothing comes and gets me off on the day. I don't have anything that derails me from, you know, these fires that come throughout the day. So I'm pretty much able to get, you know, through my day without any challenges at all, which is complete bullshit, right? We all have every single day things that come at us from every direction. And what that causes, if we aren't absolutely clear about what our priorities are, is that reactive mode, right? And I think we've all been there. You're in the middle working on something. All of a sudden, an email comes in and you're like, oh my gosh, I got to take care of this. And so you jump into that email and then I'm in reactive mode right here. And next thing you know, 15, 20 minutes have gone by and I'm completely derailed. Same thing happens with our teams. And the easiest way that we can work through this is making sure that there's absolute clarity around what are our priorities, right? Like what are like, what absolutely has to get done? We're gonna have things come at us left and right all day. And if we don't know how to, to, how to basically systematically go through and identify where is my focus number one, where is my focus number two, essentially what's gonna happen is we're all subject to that reactivity and you get through to the end of the day and you feel like, man, I've failed in so many levels. I didn't get the priorities done. I'm not even sure I know what the priorities are. What does winning look like here? And you know, I, I'll share with you, this happened to me today, actually. I was, we were on with, uh, with somebody on our team and having a conversation around really them feeling like they were completely you know, overwhelmed and not sure what they needed to be focused on in a given day, because, you know, I would send something to them, Mark would send something else to them, then the team would bring something else to them. And they're just like, I don't even know where to start. And it's completely overwhelming. That's a failure on leadership right there. That's a failure because we have not brought clarity to the team around what are the priorities and how do you go about analyzing when things are coming at you during the day, where you need to focus and prioritize your time. So having that conversation and really breaking down for each individual in the team, their roles and responsibilities and, hey, how do you prioritize? Here's what's going to come at you. Let's, let's whiteboard, like, what are all the things that could derail you in a day? This, 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 let's put them all down. And then going through that with the team to say, okay, how would we prioritize And making sure that there's understanding around when those things come, do we stop what we're doing and go over and take care of this thing that appears to be urgent or do we stay on task because this is our priority? Now there's an, another lesson that was taught in this and I think this is almost even more valuable. This is important for us as leaders, but this is super important for our team. It's the idea of detach or detachment, right? So we've all been in those moments where things are just absolutely chaotic and literally you feel like you cannot catch your breath. Your, your day is packed with calendar invite after calendar invite after calendar invite. You've got emails coming in. You've got the team calling. You've got agents calling. You've got clients calling you. And literally it's that point where you're like, almost like, is this going to be a panic attack, right? That's coming on right now. That is the point instead of like head down in the business where we want to stay so focused often, you need to lift up take a deep breath, survey the surroundings and understand, okay, do I need to take a walk right now? Right? Is this the time when I need to fully step away or can I take a couple deep breaths and then reassess and reprioritize? The worst thing that you or the team can do in that situation is literally just be like, oh my gosh, what is the hottest fire that I can run to right now? I'll put that one out. What's the next one? What's the next one? That's that reactive mode that pulls us off the game, off our game and allows us not to be productive and effective throughout the day. The same space needs to be given to our team. Our team needs to understand that, hey, when you get in these moments, detach, right? Lift your head up, take a deep breath and reassess. Go through all these things that in your mind you feel are super overwhelming that you've got on your plate, reprioritize and then go back at it. What that will lead to at the end of the day 
that's going to lead to a much more fulfilled day because of your sense of accomplishment on those high priority activities is going to be that much greater. Guess what? The team benefits from it as well. The team is going to get through those priorities as opposed to us looking at the end of the day and being like, what did you even do, right? Like how insulting is that if you go to your team and say, what did you even do? And literally they're completely overwhelmed because they are getting beat up from every single direction, but we're just not aware because we had five priorities we wanted them to get done but we haven't taught them how to prioritize and we haven't worked through that process. Dude, okay. the, the common thing there, Chris, is how many times, have, I'll speak for myself, how many times have I walked up and been like, hey, did you get to so-and-so? Like some lead that that realtor just uh, texted me and I'll walk over a teammate. I don't have any idea what they've been through in that day. And I'm like, hey, did you, you got back to Mr. Smith, right? And it's like, <laughs> you know, how insulting is that, right? That's what hit me like dead between the eyes when you said that. It's like, um, you know, maybe they did, maybe they didn't, you know, maybe I, who knows like what went on in that day. Um, but like, that's that moment of pressure that if I could detach and take a breath and really see the situation for what it is, um, you know, I'd be better. But there's so many, <laughs> there's so many times where I know that I'm not being the leader that you know, I need to be in those situations. I know nobody else on this call can relate to that either. Exactly. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. So let's let's bring it home with law number four, right? And this is the goal where we all want to get to. It's decentralized command. So essentially, if you were to break that down, instead of all decisions having to come through me or one individual, we have empowered our team to be able to take absolute ownership over their role. They feel empowered to make decisions. They feel empowered to show up and take care of their clients and make decisions on behalf of the business because of the fact that we have absolutely been clear and concise around what the message is and what the vision is. We have helped them set priorities. We've helped them with detachment. They feel supported because they are part of the team. Now the way that they show up and make decisions is going to be so much more in line with how your vision of the team running is. So the decentralized command, again, is one that like I have I have jumped to that step far too many times and not been clear and not absolutely made sure that the team is on board with steps one, two, and three. And so if I were to share anything with you guys, take a look right now at, at the way that your teams are structured and the way you're communicating with your team. Have you done a good job of making sure that they feel safe, they feel supported, that we win together, that we fail together, right? Like it's okay if we, if, if we fail, we're going to get through this and we're going to figure it out as a team, right? Are they absolutely, if you were to ask them, hey, talk me through your role, talk me through where your priorities are. Do you feel confident that they absolutely are on the same page and we have, you know, mutual expectations, mutual agreements on that? And if you don't, guys, this is a great time to go back and be like, hey, this was a miss. Own it as a leader, right? Like I missed on this and I'm setting our team up for, a, for failure as a whole. I want to come back and really make sure that we have clarity around each one of our roles and how we show up because the end goal is I want you guys to be fulfilled. I want you guys to be empowered. I want you to absolutely own your role. And I know to do that, we have to go through this process here. So you guys have the tools and you have the support you need to be able to make those decisions. And at the end of the day, here's, I mean, for me as a leader, I want my team to be fulfilled. I want them literally when they end their day to feel like I won today. I love what I do. I made a difference. And in order for that to happen, we've got to get to that point of decentralized command or empowerment to the team. So that is the four laws of, of combat. Any addition, anything you guys would, would have questions on this that you guys want to jump into or any other comments? I'll just make a quick comment, Chris, on the decentralized command. Um, great job, by the way, explaining the four laws of combat. I, I, I know it's been true for myself when I have undermined decentralized command. And every time that I jump into something that in all rights, the person on my team should be able to solve on their own, they have the resources, they have the ability, we just have to kind of empower and inspire them a little bit to take ownership and to work through it. But I have moments where I'll have a knee-jerk reaction and I'll want to jump in and I'll want to solve. And it's one of those things that I am absolutely working on. I've gotten better over the years, but we need to be aware that decentralized command is very intentional with how we address problems or challenges that come up on our teams. 
And if, if we are constantly re-jumping in to solve those problems, when the person that's on the team has the ability to solve them and, and just needs a little inspiration, a little bit of encouragement, we can really undermine that decentralized command. So if you're sitting here listening to decentralized command and going, well, geez, I really wish that my team would, would do that. Check in with how you are, how you are inspiring de decentralized command. Are you jumping in all the time? Or when they ask you a question, are you asking them a question back? That's a great question, Chris. How would you handle it, right? Let them have a minute to brainstorm, like turn it into a mini coaching session and then inspire them and send them back out because it is absolutely intentional that we have to train our team to take decentralized command because they don't want to make mistakes. They don't want to fail us. So we have to encourage them and, and, and nudge them to make those decisions and make those calls. Great, great addition on that, Josh. Appreciate it, bud. Yeah, um, man, I I, um, <clears throat> I feel like this is great content. Um, I, I'm in the spirit of time. I'm gonna really just briefly highlight this uh, and down to its bottom line because I know Josh has got a lot of content he's gonna move through today as well. Um, and so you, you know, the lesson that I really picked out, and I think the reason this hit me so hard is that the contrast of what these gentlemen were doing. A mistake meant life and death. Whereas, you know, when we make a mistake, it might seem like life and death, but really it's just that we're going to be eating cat food and our favorite realtor is going to go work with someone else, right? But we ain't going to die. And I think that that is like, uh, you know, the major thing uh, about this. And uh, I'm just going to share with you the story and then we'll move on. And uh, if there's if, if there's time on another session, we can dig into this more. But I really feel like it's something we all need to work on. Um, and we're doing a really good job at getting better at this on on our production team, which I'm proud of. But that is um, better than game day practice conditions. Uh, and and I, I know Ryan has this uh, this saying that, if, you know, a lot of people say practice makes perfect. But um, it's actually perfect practice makes perfect, right? When you look at the most elite of elite at, at anything, uh, you know, Michael Jordan in basketball or, or, or Kobe Bryant or, uh, or LeBron James or Tiger Woods, like, you know, the, the way that they practice, um, all of those people are hailed to have better practice regimen than anybody else. And this group right here, mortgage originators, uh, stereotypically, we do not do that well. Um, you know, we we don't like uh, role play and get in each other's faces and like, you know, just say the worst possible comeback that somebody could say and really practice how we would respond in those situations. And the story that they tell is there's a gentleman that had tons of combat experience. He was going off for his like fourth deployment and Jocko and Leif were getting everybody ready for this deployment. And he came up to this gentleman who was leading his whole uh, battalion in, in this uh, training exercise, the last one that they do before they went out. And they said to him, hey, be careful. Um, you know, we've, we've taken a lot of people through this and there's been a lot of friendly fire casualties and just make sure you know where everybody is tonight. And so... The guy kind of shrugged it off uh, because he had been to battle several times. He had led lots of troops. He was a veteran. Everybody respected him. And what he didn't know is that Jocko and Leif had set up actors uh, in, in the course. And they went through what they thought was going to be their normal training regimen. Uh, and they went out there and there was like ladies holding babies and screaming and approaching them and smoke bombs going off everywhere. Like the worst possible craziest conditions no one was ready for and that night three of his teammates were killed and they were all killed by his team friendly fire right and this is a huge deal in the military you get called into the office uh, there's a permanent thing that goes on your record that even though it was like training conditions um that you know, this this was something that absolutely can't happen. And this was a really high ranking official in, in the military. And so I say that to say, how are you practicing right now? I know that none of us are satisfied with our results, but are we really putting the game day conditions in? 
you know, we're doing a lot on our team with game film. I will record a session that I'm trying to convert a lead. Or if I'm trying to win a realtor over and I'm on Zoom, I'm recording those and I'm sending them to my mentors, uh, if, if, if it's permissible with banking law. And I'm saying, dude, what could I have done better here? Right. And I'm getting my team together now for an hour every week. And all we do is work on our business. I was never doing that before. And guess what? After three weeks, I'm already seeing results. Um, on, on involvement, right? Going back to what Chris said, the key to all of it, to really helping people learn is involvement. So do you have a battlefield? Are you coming to tribe and you're ready and you want to practice and you want worse than game day conditions? Do you, how many times have you failed this week, right? It's these lessons, it's, it's the adversity it's going through this like so many times. <clears throat> I have to give Ryan credit. I was absolutely so. So we do this thing every year in our coaching program where all of us uh, are are scripting. Like we're handed a question and we battle. Like it's battle royale on who's gonna win. And everyone votes. Like two people go head to head. Everyone votes. And Ryan, Josh, both of them, but were so impressive. And I was thinking to myself, how are they that good? It's practice. Their, their practice regimen is better than mine, right? They, Ryan has written every possible comeback to every possible objection. And he's gone through it over and over and over and over. So no matter what you threw at him that night, he was on his game and, and, you know, I, I just giving credit where credit's due and it's the most applicable thing that I can, you know, muster up right now. But what I will say to all of us and, and my challenge to us here at Tribe as well is how can we continue to create better than game day conditions? How can we create an atmosphere where you can come here, feel safe, openly practice and get better at your craft, right? And part of that is learning these leadership lessons, but how can you create that on your own? Are you doing the work? Are you putting in the reps? Are you swinging? Are you getting in the batting cage? Um, because you need to be prepared for game day. When that realtor comes and says, hey, I'm sorry, buddy, uh, we're going down the street. How are you gonna handle that? Are you ready for it? Have you practiced it? Worst case possible outcome, how many times? Like. These are the things that we need to be ready for. And so um, it, it really hit home because what those guys are dealing with meant life and death. And what we're dealing with doesn't. Um, and, and the contrast was like, it hit me right between the eyes. But we can do a lot better of how we're practicing what we're doing. Hey, Mark. So just to bring a little bit of practicality to the theory you know, we have people at our teams and our organizations that we're trying to bring up and loan officer assistants may not be good at reaching out to borrowers and being proactive and being influential to get documents back. And they're dang sure uncomfortable. So you could schedule, for example, a 30 minute uh, scripting where we bring all the LOAs in or all the processors, whoever's dealing with clients, and we script back and forth and they get to hear us overcome the objectives. I get to be the loan processor or I get to be the loan officer assistant. You get to be the client who doesn't want to send me another bank statement. And we get, a, we get a joust it out and we get a work scripting and they get to see how we have, how we create influence to get things back. Um, you know, we, we probably have a lot of loan officers that are newer loan officers on our teams. And the simple scripting around, hey, what's your rate? How come my credit union has a, a, a lower interest rate? Or why are you different? Why should I do business with you? Those are the scripting things that are so easy for us to do. And to your point, Mark, 30 minutes a week to work with our teams to help them with that scripting will massively increase their confidence and increase the amount of influence that they have to get the person on the other end of the phone to, to cooperate and to do what we want them to do. Really well said, man. Thanks for the uh, bringing the clarity there. I appreciate it, dude. Yeah, that was great.
Are you uh are you are you handing it off to me? Or are you still rolling? Yeah, I, I just was waiting if there's any more comments uh, or concerns. Otherwise, yeah, I, I really want to uh, get this last concept out. Um, and uh, yeah, I was just waiting for a second there. Thanks, buddy. I'll hand yeah. it over to Joshua. And what? Just one more question along this line: Is, is anybody doing something similar to this that has a best practice it, that they could share with us? You know, one thing I'll say for one person team um, is getting the involvement from your underwriter or your processor, like 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 Josh said, most of the time when they're wound up and they're not doing what you want them to do, if you call and really like engage with them and say, oh man, I know you're you're worried about this condition and I assure you it's legit and like I would never put you in that position and I'll get this to you and we'll get clarity. Would that make you feel better? Uh, would, would you feel comfortable around that? I would have those conversations all the time. And like, you, you know, it, it was crazy. Like when they got one of my files, they picked it up, right? They, they underwrote it with gusto, but that didn't happen overnight. It happened because I did that over and over and over. I took the time to really engage and involve that underwriter in my practice. And it, it just as a solo practitioner, and I had to do it for survival. Like I, my deals had to get done, right? So it's just a way that even if you're a solo practitioner and your teammates are, are outside of, of you and, and at your company, you can enroll them in this, in this same philosophy. Yeah, brother. Well said. Craig, I know you just um, transitioned out of origination and essentially you know, turned over your book of business to your team. Did you have any best practices around this, how you made that transition and how you made your team sound and and the experience replicatable, like you were still in the in the in the face to face with clients. I think it's a, <clears throat> I think it's a process, Josh. <clears throat> I don't think it just happens. You know, I think you have to find the right person, and, and you know all about disc profiling and finding the right person that compliments you uh, in that in that role and who to hand off to. Um, I, I like to I like to when I'm training, I like to let people read my emails, watch the videos I'm making, see my TCAs, all that stuff. I like to watch, make them watch me do what the work is. And then I like to watch them do it myself. And sort of that's the process of back and forth that I think uh, happens over time. And what happens is eventually they start just sounding like you. And then you know, uh, and then you know that they're ready. And I think the, the underlying point that, that Mark is sharing that we learned from the, from the Jocko event and what you're sharing, Craig, is that this stuff doesn't happen accidentally. It takes intention. It takes time, spending time with them and putting a calendar in fight that we're gonna do scripting on Thursday for 30 minutes. But it doesn't happen if we don't create the environment as leaders. And both of you have you know, maybe a little bit different way to do it, but it's, it's intentional, it's not accidental. Thanks, Craig, appreciate it. Nope, yeah, nobody, nobody likes role-playing, Josh, so I would, I would just tell people not to call it that. They say, hey, let's role-play. Loan officers are going to cringe, but if you just all of a sudden just start doing it without actually saying you're doing it, uh, it works a lot better. They call that a booby trap. I think that you're, you're saying we got a booby trap them. <laughs> all right, cool. Uh, Mark, thanks for the handoff. Great job, Chris. Great job. I'm going to jump into OODA, OODA loop, not LUDA, OODA, OODA loop. And this was something that is um, fairly fairly complex to describe. And I've tried to make it as simple as humanly possible. I've also put together a slide deck that I'm gonna share with everybody that has more copy and text and descriptive words on a slideshow than I would normally use. But I wanted you to be able to take this content and immediately use it with your teams. And so I put enough of the description and words in this PowerPoint presentation that you could literally leverage with your teams tomorrow. And the OODA loop is a mental decision framework. And as leaders, there might not be any skill more important than the ability to make a decision and to move forward, learn from the experience, and then recalibrate and decide where to go from there. And so UDA is a framework of how to make decisions, how to make them quickly, and then how to recalibrate and move forward from there. What we're gonna do is walk through the slides and give you an understanding of what the OODA loop is. And then we're gonna discuss two case studies. So we're gonna talk about the better.com 
and the, you know, the CEO, Vishal, the, the whole firing thing. And we're going to talk about how he could have used the OODA loop to potentially have a better outcome. And then we're going to talk about loan processing. We're going to talk about how a loan processor might use the OODA loop. And I feel that this concept is um, esoteric enough. It's, it's, it's heavy enough that as the, the more examples we have to bring this home in a practical fashion, the better. So as I'm going through this, if you think of something where you're like, oh, I use the OODA loop. I didn't even know I was doing it, but I use this or I could apply this to this area of my life. Then I encourage you to jot down a note and we'll open it up for some Q&A at the end. All right. So I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Let's make sure I share the right screen. Cool. Let me know. Okay, a thumbs up, Ledley, if you can see that. All right. Cool. Thanks, buddy. All right, so the OODA loop, let's, okay, cool. The OODA loop is the cycle observe, let me move this out of the way, observe, observe orient, decide, act. It was developed by a military strategist, the United States Air Force Colonel John Boyd, who became one of the most brilliant military strategists and then later uh, turned it into all kinds of business advice um, that the military has ever had. He applied the concepts to the combat operations process, often at the operational level during military campaigns. So John Boyd was an Air Force uh, fighter jet pilot, and he realized that he was fighting a war against an enemy. I believe this was the Korean War, if I remember correctly, with an enemy that had a superior plane. And so he came up with the OODA loop as a decision-making process that enabled him to have more, but to enable him to have an advantage even over an opponent that has uh, superior firepower, if you will. So the approach explains how agility can overcome raw power in dealing with human opponents. It's especially applicable to cybersecurity, cyber warfare, and loan processing. And just about anything else, I was thinking about, you know, how to use how I use this in terms of investment decisions and a whole plethora of of um, areas. All right. So according to Boyd, decision making occurs in a reoccurring cycle, the cycle of observe, orient, decide and act an entity, whether an individual or an organization that can process this cycle quickly, observing and reacting to the unfolding events more rapidly than the opponent can thereby get inside the opponent's decision cycle and gain the advantage. Going back to how John Boyd came up with this in the fighter pilot scenario, he realized that even though the opponent had superior firepower in terms of their jet, if he was able to act quickly, orient and decide and see how they respond and then act quickly again, he realized that the fact that he could act quickly was more powerful than, the, uh, than his fighter jet that wasn't as advanced as the uh, enemy. So Boyd's diagram shows all the that all decisions are based on observations of the evolving situation tempered with filtering the problem being addressed. So we have a, we observe the situation, we orient to all the facts and the, um, the um, new information that is revealed to us, and we figure out how are we going to use that information to solve the problem. The observations are the raw information on which decisions and actions are based. The observed information must be processed to orient it for decision making. I'm going to bring this home and make this a little bit more practical, so stick with me. I just want to give you as much background on the OODA loop as possible before we get really tactical. So the second O is orientation or orient, is the most important part of the OODA loop since it shapes the way we observe, the way we decide, and the way we act. The orient, to orient oneself with a problem, challenge, or puzzling situation is to get curious and think. So we first observe and we try to wrap our heads around the overall situation. Then we orient to the challenge or problem that is ahead of us. 
and we adopt a growth mindset. We start to get curious and to think, how do we get through this challenge? All the time, bringing in more information. So this feeds into a, a perpetual loop, which I'll get into here in just a second as we move through this. So in order to win, we should operate at a faster tempo or rhythm than our adversaries. The OODA loop provides a framework for decision-making and it requires a growth mindset. So one of the most important or beneficial pieces of adopting the OODA loop thinking and teaching it within our teams is it doesn't require perfection. It doesn't require someone to have all the information or know everything. They have to be curious. They have to have a growth mindset of how do I get through this challenge? Hmm. Once we act, we get to observe the results reorient, decide on a new approach, and act again, hence the loop. And I'll end with just one slide here from John Boyd, and then I'm going to run into some, actually, I think I'm going to take a couple of quick questions, and then I'm going to run into uh, a, a two case studies. So we got, so this is a quote from John Boyd, we got to get an image or picture in our head, which we call orientation. Then we have to make a decision as to what we're going to do and then implement the decision. Then we look at the resulting action plus our observation and we drag in new data, new orientation, new decision, new action, ad infinitum, meaning it just goes on in a perpetual cycle. So I'm actually just gonna do the time. I just glanced down at the time. I'm gonna go right into two case studies. I'm gonna try to make this very, kind of heady, esoteric, theoretical OODA loop real for each of us. So I was thinking about, um, you know, the CEO issue with Vishal and, and better.com. And one of the things that is important or crucial with the OODA loop is to understand that you can make small incremental decisions. You don't have to do the whole thing at once. You can make a small decision quickly, see what the results of that is, reorient and then make the next best the next best decision based on your feedback loop right this is a feedback loop take action quickly see what happens then go back with that information and go back through that cycle again so i was thinking about this this issue uh this firing um tragedy really with, with the shawl and what came up for me was what if he didn't do this with all 900 people at the same time what if instead of doing that, he decided to do it with three people or five people so we could actually see all their faces on Zoom? And he went through that process with a smaller batch of people. So he gets on, he goes through the observe, orient, decide, act, tell them the information, and then he gets the feedback loop of their responses, which then enable him to recalibrate, rescript do it differently as he moves to a larger, um, as a larger audience. Another real quick example that I had, uh, had to do with loan processing. So let's think about what happens when a loan comes in. The first thing that the processor does is they go through the 1003 and they observe. They're trying to get their, their bearings of all the information. Then they orient themselves with the challenges. Okay. I see that the LO said that he has documented six months reserves, but I know Chase Jumbo is going to require nine months reserves. We have a potential problem. Now he's oriented to the, they've oriented themselves to the potential problem. Okay, what am I going to do? Now I need to decide, am I going to send the file back? Am I going to email the client, put the file down and come back in a few days? Am I going to call the client? Is the loan locked? How much time do I have? This is all part of Orient, trying to figure out what are the challenges, how do I work through it based on all the information I have, and then decide, okay, the loan's locked. I only have 10 days to close this thing. I'm going to call the client right now, see if there's another asset account so I can keep moving this file forward. And then as that data comes back in, you, the loop starts over. Observe, Orient, decide, and act. The most important thing about the OODA loop is it is... Two things really. 
it is a process or a system to help you make decisions and move forward with all the information you have. What's the best course of action right now? I need to decide and I need to act and I need to keep moving forward with this loan. The second thing is it gives our teams the permission to not know all the answers. It gives them the permission to have a growth mindset. It gives them the permission, like Carol Dweck says, um, who's the, you know, the, the founder of the thought of growth mindset. It has, she has that philosophy of not yet. You know, she said that the best learners are those that have a mindset that I don't know how to do that yet, but I can learn how to do it. I can learn how to implement it. So I'm going to turn it over for a few questions. I'd love to see if anybody else has any stories of how they've either used the OODA loop or a scenario in their lives where they think they, they could use the OODA loop. Gosh, I, I just want to make one comment on this, you know, because I think that this, this goes in parallel so well with the, the laws of combat and the idea of empowering our teams, right? So yes. what we want to do is, is once we've gotten to that state, we're, we're in a leadership role. We want to invest in them and help them make better decisions. So this is a great tool that creates confidence in the way decisions are made, right? And I think we all are aware that when there's a lack of confidence, it creates that indecisiveness, right? And when there's indecisiveness, I'm questioning, is this the right way to go about it? Maybe I should do this. Maybe I should do this. And in second guessing, you know, I, may go, I might go down the wrong path. Give them this tool teach them this tool, it's going to increase confidence in their ability to make decisions and not have to always come back and say, you know, hey, Josh, can I run this one by you? No, I want you to have confidence. You are the right person for this role. You have more knowledge about this role than I do. Now I want you to be empowered with the confidence to make those decisions on a daily basis. That's where they rise to the next level. That's where you get that, that world-class team that people are envious of. And they're like, what are you doing on your team? Like, how does your team just own this? They're empowered. They know how to make decisions. So I think walking through that process, as complex as it can sound, as you're kind of going through the, the, the backstory of it, the simple process of each one of those steps in teaching that to your team is really going to help elevate that confidence level in the way they make decisions. Yeah, I, I, I could. Sorry, go ahead, Josh. No, go ahead, buddy. I couldn't agree more. And, and the same thing with, you know, perfect practice makes perfect. Like, Taking this uh, constant loop around what is your rate and, and the, the game day practice decisions, right? You, you script it a few times, you're getting good collaboration. You're like, mm, that's, not, that's not quite right, but let's test this, right? And, and then you're doing it and pretty soon you're inside the head of your competitor. You know what you're, you're gonna be up against and how you're gonna come back against that. And, it, and you start to gain the advantage. And I think, you know, making this applicable for all of us, how are you answering that question? Like you see what's coming, right? You see that it's a race to the bottom and, and people are all just hinging on, on rate. How are you using this loop to get ahead of that and to beat your competition? Well, and Mark, you know, the, this framework for decision-making, what was so powerful for me was the concept around, you know, in, in, in order to win, we should operate at a faster tempo or, ryth or rhythm than our adversaries. And so it tells us what we can't do is freeze. We can't get to that place where we realize we've got an issue with reserves and just go, oh crap, this can be easier to handle tomorrow, right? The, the person who moves the fastest is the one who is going to win. And it also gives us the framework that we don't have to go all the way in at once. We can take, you know, we can take baby steps. Like I was thinking to myself, you know, when we started doing consumer direct marketing for physicians, we didn't launch 50 websites and put a $25,000 a month budget behind it, right? We filmed three YouTube videos that took me 30 minutes and we put them up and we went, does anybody watch? Oh crap, people are watching. Okay, let's put some money behind it. Let's, let's do one website. Oh my gosh, there's leads. Okay, they're coming off this page on the website. Okay, let's do more of that. And then it, it builds. So the important thing is not to be, not to have a paralysis by analysis, but to make a small step quickly, reorient with the feedback you get and then make the next step. It is, it is something to put us in perpetual motion rather than freezing up. And that framework I think is really important for our teams and us as leaders to be aware of. 
Yeah, I, I had a I had an example recently. I, I think it, it fits in with this. Um, you know, it's really that uh, you know that um, uh, which one of the three is it? You know, the observe and then the orient, right? It's kind of assessing and kind of what you're talking about, Josh. Of like sometimes it does pay to to react, and and, and at the same time though, sometimes it's to step back. And and I I was actually doing a coaching call recently, and you know, really came to this awareness of like, you know, I just don't like sitting with uncomfortability. Right. And so like, you know, my natural reaction when something comes up is to like hop in and solve and fix and to get in it. And, um, and, 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 you know, in some ways that served me well, but in other cases, it's like, you know, you know, there's that orient, right. Of just like, and it's, you know, I'm thinking of the, of course, the one we've all read the Victor Frankl, you know, we, you know, uh, of, you know, pause that we all have to uh, between stimulus and response, you know, and it was like, um, it, as soon as I'm like, well, wait a minute, I've created this situation where I feel like I need to react now. when really I don't, as soon as I came to that awareness and I'm like, hey, I can sit on this. I can, it, it, but my stress level went down and then my thinking was clear and everything like that. And, um, you know, I think that was just, that was just something that came to mind for me with, with, with this of, uh, you know, of just kind of taking that moment to assess because it's sometimes, again, it pays to, to strike and react and solve. And other times it's, it's exactly the opposite. And, you know, that's been an issue for me is I've kind of got one speed in one setting um, and just trying to hit that that pause button and uh, that orientation, I think, is a critical, critical piece. Great share, Billy. Thanks for sharing so vulnerable, man. That was, that was really great. And I agree with you. Um, the orient is the, the, the point where you decide what is, what am I, what action am I going to take? And sometimes that action should just be, I need to pause that, that, but you know, this is a moment where I might fall flat, fat on my face as a leader, and I'm just going to pause and put a little time there. Um, so great, great share. Thanks, Bill. Anybody else have, uh, have a share as it relates to the, the OODA loop? All right. Cool. Work, uh, I want to, I, I want to throw out, oh, sorry. Did somebody want to add on something? No? Ahead, okay. Buddy. I I just want to throw out there, you know, there were there were three concepts that were shared today, right? The laws of combat, the better than practice, the, the better than than reality practice conditions, and the OODA loop. It's a lot to take in, and we absolutely recognize that. What my recommendation and, and really the the value of this community here is we've masterminded, right? Like we've talked about this idea. Now to go back and apply this practically in your business and bring back to the group on our next question, on our next Q&A session, like, hey, what worked? Like, where did you have a win with this? Or where did you have a challenge with this? Because these, these processes or lessons that we're teaching on here, we don't want this to feel like, all right, we've given you the information. Now go out there, you're on your own on this. This is a, a community. This is a collaborative approach. So by bringing back your experience when you actually work to implement, when you go back and meet with the team and say, hey guys, I might've missed as a leader. I want to talk through how we can become better as a team, right? Bring that back. You're not alone in this. Everybody's going to be going through that. How do I get the team really to rally around this? So real life examples of what you guys are going through and us being able to work through it and talk through it as a team here, that's where we all elevate our game together. So I would love it if we can have that as a takeaway and, and really look to bring back in our next question and answer uh, session that we have something practical that you guys have tried to apply from what you learned today. Love that, Love Chris. It, Chris. Uh, yeah, and I think that the to Josh's point, the faster we implement, you know, the the better uh, we're going to be. Um, and I know it was a lot. Like we learned all of this stuff over you know two days and and hours of of lecture and you know putting it all down um, in front of you guys is a lot. But I hope that you'll take one of these things uh, away. You'll start to implement. You start to have, start to have some awareness. Our next uh, meeting is January 6th, uh, so this is it for the year, which is, which is crazy, uh, and that will be our Q&A webinar, and on that webinar, you guys, that's where we take, all right, we all learned something here today. Let's, let's take something away, and on that Q&A webinar, we're going to work through the challenges, right? It, it's better than game day conditions, and that's where we come to practice our craft, to collaborate, uh, to really get the, the assets that this tribe has to collaborate and just get better together, um, which is great. And after that, uh, Craig Strent, who's the CEO of Apex Home Loans, is going to tell us about his financial planning uh, planner system. It, it, the guy is honestly one of the best in the country at 
financial planners and how to add value to those folks. Um, and I, I think it will be uh, really good. Allison, I know we didn't get back to your question around scripting. And so please email Krista. And what we'll do is we'll make that the very first thing that we tackle in our Q&A uh, when we get back together on the 6th. On behalf of all of us, you guys, thank you so much. Um, I am so grateful for this community of people. You all make me better. Uh, I, I hope that going into the holiday, you're able to stay present, uh, really be proud of what you've accomplished and, and um, really have some, some great holidays with your families and uh, some really good downtime uh, until January 6th. Um, yeah, thank you so much. We, we appreciate it. Be well and happy new year. Merry Christmas and uh, bye everyone. Take care. Happy holidays, everybody. Thanks guys. Happy holidays.